have a seat. Hello. And hello, Hi. Tommy and John. Hi. Welcome. So, Wait. Favreau, that's Wait. the John Favreau one. Yeah. That's the John Lovett one, and he's Tommy Wheater. Welcome. Uh, thanks for having us. It's so, good to be here. Have you been very bored yet? I mean, you're in Norway. It's, um, I mean, we have interesting people here, but our prime minister is Anna Solberg, not Donald Trump. So right. how, how is everything? It's Are you good. Relaxed? I went to the Monk Museum. It was a very uplifting experience. Uh, <laughs> I asked the makeup artist to make me look like one of the paintings. I don't know if we achieved that. <laughs> I just woke up. What time is it here? <laughs> you know, don't think about it. Don't even think about it. Um, the sun is setting. It's never sunny. It's winter in Norway, so just stay inside. How do you people stay positive? <laughs> Sunset at 2.30 in the afternoon. <laughs> Answer to that is that we don't really, we, we're not that positive. I see. No. But uh, we are trying, the, the theme of this <laughs> conference is the value of work. And we're trying to have a conversation about how, how do we keep this society that we are quite proud of, mm -hmm. we are, say that, uh, how to keep this thing going for decades and decades. Right. Uh, there are some, um, yeah, some clouds in the horizon. Uh, but the What's value it like of to have clouds in the horizon? What it's like? We're covered in them. <laughs> <laughs> what a pleasant thing like it is <laughs> to have a conference about the future. We're trapped in a nightmare present. <laughs> We're dealing with things all the time right now. We are people trying to drag us backwards. Yeah, well, how do you do that? It's terrible. We don't know. We're here to help. We're here to find out what to do. Okay, so let's I'm not try quite together. interested in your future problems. <laughs> <laughs> what are we going to do? How are we going to maintain a, a social welfare system 80 years from now when we run out of oil? We are in a pro we have problems now. <laughs> we, we give everyone health care, but will it last? <laughs> okay, How so dare start, you? Let's start How with your problems. How dare you? <laughs> How dare you call these problems? Look at you, so self-satisfied. Where's that prince? <laughs> Where's the prince? John, they're over there. Where's the prince? So you have a prince. <laughs> we have Don Jr. <laughs> <laughs> what are you worried about? Take hey, calm down. I'm going to be fine. <laughs> Yeah. OK, so let's not talk about problems. Let's talk about solutions then, John. Great. Right. Right. Yeah. OK, unemployment, <laughs> Was big factor. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Never mind questions. Questions are very lost here. So yeah, but solutions. Yeah. OK, so say we have the same problems in a few years that you guys have now then. Uh, big farts of you. I mean, people, uh, you don't have enough jobs. How does that affect the politics? Would Trump even have been elected president if the, the rates would have been better during elections? So uh, there's been a fierce <laughs> debate about that in the United States. I think it is, look, in an election that was decided by 75,000 votes across three states, um, it's possible. But when you look back at, so there's all this political science research that you know if the economy is growing uh, in a presidential election, then that usually helps the incumbent. In this case, the incumbent would have been Hillary Clinton. If the economy is sluggish, it helps the challenger. Um, in the 2016 election, it was sort of on the edge, which would have spoken to a pretty close election, which is what we had. Um, but a lot of research has been done since the election. And it, it, it looks like economics were not the driving factor in people's decision, people who voted for Trump and that um, racial animus was actually a much stronger indicator of being a Trump voter. So Trump voters were largely white, but they came from the upper income scales and they came from the lower income scales. So it wasn't, it's not necessarily the economy that actually um, helped elect him. But let's say you don't want Trump as a president. Is, let's just say you don't want that. Mm -hmm. I assume you don't. Uh, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Can you fix it? it what, the employment? The employment situation? No, the, the reasons behind him being elected. Oh, the reasons behind him being elected. Yeah, no, I, I hope so. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> so please enlighten us. Uh, no, I, I think that there's a, I think the, the relevance of the economy and jobs, I think it, to be serious, I think that if it does play into this, it plays into a, a lack of trust in institutions and a feeling as though maybe the economy is, is growing and maybe there are jobs, but they're not the right kind of jobs. And there's people that feel like they're left behind. They feel like they can't trust the government to address problems in their lives. They don't trust the media. They don't trust the institutions of civic society. And someone like Donald Trump can 
uh, exploit that weakness and come along and, and tell people he can solve all their problems. He can uh, find scapegoats. He can find uh, immigrants to blame. He can um, you know, divide people, and that can be effective. And I think one way the economy is relevant to that is I think, and it's something similar, I think it's a, a set of problems that's not unique to the United States, is with automation, um, with widening chasms between rich and poor, um, even if the economic numbers overall look okay, there are millions and millions of people who feel like the world is changing and leaving them behind. Yeah. Um, and that leaves us vulnerable. And I think one of the things that, that connects what a country like Norway is going through and a country like the United States is going through is how do you adjust what government policies you put in place uh, to not make those problems worth, worse. And I think right now the United States is in a very bad cycle, in a cycle of uh, that mistrust leading to us going backwards. So we have widening chasm between, between rich and poor in the United States, and so what did we just do? We passed corporate tax cuts and, uh, um, which will, and, and deregulation, and now the next phase for our Congress is gonna be trying to, to reduce the welfare state when people are depending on it more than ever. So I think making sure that in that environment of mistrust, in that environment in which people feel left behind, that the policies you put in place create opportunity, create more egalitarian uh, systems so that people can get ahead and trust will sort of slowly yeah. the core, start to the come core back. Of our, the core of our economic challenge in the United States is sluggish wage growth combined with a fraying social safety net. Um, and those two things mean that there's a lot of people with who, even the people who have jobs, um, some of them are still in poverty or some of them are just above poverty. And when politicians in both parties campaign and say, vote for me, I'll fix all your problems, and then they put them into office and all the problems haven't been solved because of gridlock and all the other problems we have politically, um, that feeds a cycle of, as Lovett was saying, of mistrust, and it, uh, it makes people more likely to vote for demagogues, right? And we've seen that all over the world through history, and now you know, it, it, it's happened in the United States. Yeah. You used to be an advisor to Obama on foreign policy. Yeah. So you've seen this happen you know, in other countries, or at least you have studied. Did you, were you expecting this to happen in, in, in the US? Uh, no, I think that maybe we should have been. Uh, but I think we are, you, nationalism isn't new. Uh, demagoguing others isn't new. Uh, you know, using anger and frustration to incite people. Uh, to support you and to condemn another is not new. Uh, it was hard to watch. Uh, it happened in such an egregious fashion after eight years of Barack Obama. I mean, there was a <clears throat> there was a totally inaccurate, you know, early sense in the media that Barack Obama's election had sort of solved the entire. Uh, history of racial problems in the United States. Barack Obama didn't believe that. No one who worked for him believed that, but it, it created a massive gap between the expectation of what it meant to elect an African-American president of the United States and, and where we were as a society. Uh, and so clearly there's a lot more work to do, and a lot of the you know, sort of structural problems with inequality and the growing wage gap are, are going to um, grow as problems, not shrink. I mean, inequality in the United States, it doesn't mean your, your neighbor owns his house and has a boat and you don't it will start to mean your neighbor can afford health care that you simply can't afford that could increase his or her longevity. They can send their kids to a school that will continue to exacerbate and you know, uh, widen that gap uh, between rich and poor over time. So unless we <clears throat> deal with it uh, with smarter public policy, we're going to have these structural challenges for a long time. But like John was saying, the tax bill that just went into place is a massive giveaway to rich uh, people. And uh, the way they will pay for it is cutting food stamps uh, and other programs that support the poor. So it's, we're in a tough spot. Yeah, but did you know that? I mean, I, I listened to your podcast, obviously, and um, <laughs> you and I, and I guess everyone here, were quite sure that uh, Hillary Clinton would be the president right now. Right. How could you be so surprised? Because what I heard in your voices, at least, I think I heard was uh, shock, uh, you were surprised, and also very, very sad. Uh, but should you have seen this happening? I <clears throat> I think uh, we, in the run-up to the election, I think one of the lessons we took away from it was um, you have to be willing to point out problems on your own side because you know, we believed that it was so urgent to kind of be a booster for Hillary Clinton to try to make sure that Democrats were elected because we saw Trump as such a threat. Um, and because we 
were in a position where people were in some way looking to us a bit to reassure them that we didn't want people to panic. We wanted people to do what they could to help Hillary Clinton win. Um, in the months before an election, you face this challenge, right? You want to say, hey, you know, you need to change direction a little bit. We're not, we're not totally sold on this message, and there are problems with the Democratic campaign. But if you're a Democrat, and the way our media works right now, if you start pointing that out, all of a sudden, there's stories about Democratic infighting and how Democrats are attacking one another, and that hurts the cause. <laughs> now, I'm not saying that we had some great big platform, but I think one of the things we took away from that election and one of the things we've tried to do, do since is when we see problems on our own side, we point them out early and we point them out often because we went into that election saying Donald Trump can't win. He's too dangerous. It's just not possible. And though the polls were tightening and though it was a perfect storm from an investigation, you know, <laughs> we now know that, there were, that both Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump were being investigated by our FBI. We got some problems, guys. <laughs> you say that out loud in Norway and you think, I don't want to bash my own country to you people. How dare you? <laughs> we, but uh, <laughs> uh, it was... Um, it was hard to believe it was possible, and I think none of us really wanted to recognize just how vulnerable we were to someone like Donald Trump. A few hundred, th uh, you know, a few dozen thousand votes in a few places, we're not having this conversation. It really was a perfect storm. So I think the question is not to ask, why were you shocked by the election? The question is, even though Donald Trump should have lost, what allowed it to be close in the first place? And I think the twin, co twin challenges of economic inequality and racial animus were enough to offer well, an explanation. We'd never, we'd never had a candidate who so overtly racialized the election before. So we've had Republicans since the days of Nixon um, kind of throw out all these racist dog whistles um, because they wanted to win over Southern white voters who had been Democrats before. So we've seen this over time in the United States, but we'd never even even when the Republican opponent, when the Republican running was running against. Barack Obama, first, Afri first African-American president, neither John McCain nor Mitt Romney made such overt appeals to people's fears and anxieties about race and about immigration as Donald Trump had. Donald Trump launched his entire political career by saying Barack Obama was not born in the United States, was other, was different than you, yeah. was somehow scary, didn't love America, didn't care about you and your values, apologized for America. It was this specious garbage from day one. And I don't think that we were prepared for what that might do, even though it's funny because we all saw Brexit happen. And I remember a bunch of commentators in the United States saying, you know, if it can happen in the UK with Brexit, then uh, it can happen over here with Trump. And, and we thought, that's crazy. <laughs> you know, America's the big melting pot. We embrace diversity. Barack Obama is our president. And that can't happen. And I think the lesson of 2016, the lesson of Brexit, the lesson of, and you guys have obviously seen this happen uh, throughout Europe with some of these far-right parties, is that um, nativism um, is a very potent force. Yeah. Um, and um, I think that center, center-right, center-left, left parties across the world um, need a strategy to combat that nativism and take it on head-on. Um, and sort of address some of the underlying anxieties that allow that to fester. Hmm. But, you know, the other thing that's important to note is the fact that we were vulnerable to Donald Trump at all tells us there were big problems and big issues we weren't addressing. But the majority of the American people did not vote for Donald Trump. The majority of the, majority of the American people voted for Hillary Clinton. Donald Trump has never been popular. As of this moment, he has a 35% of approval rating. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that came out of the shock and horror of, of Donald Trump becoming the president of the United States, which has had, obviously, global ramifications that we're all dealing with, is it has awoken something in the United States. Um, you know, we host a podcast. It is popular. It is not popular because the three of us are so wonderful, though so that's part of it. Uh, <laughs> There well, is the best a... thing that happened you know, uh, <laughs> no, when but... Trump was elected was, you know, this happened. Well, it's something. You can say that. Uh, <laughs> but uh, there is an energy and an enthusiasm that out of the fact that uh, we saw these vulnerabilities, we saw this rise of nativism, <clears throat> we saw this person put in office, uh, millions of people are protesting. You know, the day after Donald Trump becomes president, we have the largest protest in the history of the United States. And we're a country that likes to protest. Uh, 
we had, you know, the, the, they put in place uh, a Muslim ban, and then tens of thousands of people show up at airports across the country. Uh, they, the Republican Party, which has in many ways capitulated Donald Trump, um, tries to pass a health care bill, and four times the opposition, which didn't control any power in Washington, was able to stop it. So uh, the one thing I think it's important, especially because we're here, is there is good news, and the good news is we are being forced to confront some of the worst aspects of our culture, uh, and we're no longer allowed to pull the wool over our eyes. We're no longer allowed to pretend it's not happening. Uh, we've been confronted by, I think, an existential problem, and a lot of people are rising to it. So what's happening in our government uh, is not what America is doing, that there are millions of people fighting back, and hopefully that can lead to something more positive after Trump is gone. Yeah, because you're on to solutions now. Aren't you? Very positive. Yeah, you are. Very quite positive. positive. Are you? <laughs> yeah, no, sure. It, it, yeah, but seriously? It's easy are to you? view. Yeah. Politics yeah. is viewed in zero-sum terms because uh, the stories that are written if Donald Trump wins versus Hillary Clinton wins are night and day. But you're talking about a small, very thin margin of votes and in individuals who ultimately tip it one way or the other. I think one of the hard truths we have to confront is that Hillary Clinton was the wrong candidate for that time. She would have been a great president. But when you had an electorate that was saying, we're frustrated with Washington, we're frustrated with the status quo, and, and we're sick of every politician we've heard of, to say, here's a candidate that's sort of been on the public stage for 30 years was a very difficult choice and a very difficult thing for a lot of people to decide to ultimately um, you know, pull the lever for. So part of it is going to be putting forward a great standard bearer the next time around. Because it's not like Barack Obama didn't deal with uh, racial animus and... and um, you know, some of the same things that were swirling through the 2016 election. He was just able to motivate, inspire people, and turn out uh, Democrats in a number of such that he overcame it electorally. Yeah, I don't, I, 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 I don't I think, know if you guys all saw, uh, Oprah will be our next president. <laughs> right, yeah. We got it all covered. <laughs> okay, that, because that's, like, it's all taken. Okay, before we end this, we still have some time, but we have to talk about Oprah just for a few seconds. Sure, later. sure. Okay, don't forget. Well, I didn't, I didn't also, John. He was going to make a smarter and, and real point. No, 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 no. Go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> no, you had something smart to say, I can, didn't you? I'm going to save pretending. it for the Oprah thing. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you were talking about solutions uh, and uh, how society can fix itself then, right? So uh, uh, after the elections, you three guys sounded a little down. If it's, uh, that, that's correct, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Well, uh, no, we don't. And maybe it's because your podcast is uh, going well, but uh, maybe there's a few other reasons. Um, I sense some new kind of activism. Uh, is that correct? Is yes, oh, completely. Yeah. So tell I've, me about that. I have not seen uh, this level of activism in the United States since the early days of the Obama campaign. So how does that feel? It feels inspiring. It feels hopeful. I mean, if there's a if there's a silver lining out of this uh, this whole dark Trump presidency, it's that um, the American people will wake up and embrace their responsibilities as citizens. I think they're in our country for a long time. There was a view of politics that was a transactional view of politics. So that if you do show up to vote, you hand the politician your vote, you go on with your life, and then the politician goes to Washington and they fix your problems. And that's never how our democracy has been envisioned. Uh, the, the purpose of our democracy is, you know, we always say this, it's an everyday fight, it's an everyday struggle. Um, you wake up and you protest if you have to, you call your congressperson if you have to, you run for office yourself if you're, if you're not happy with it. That's, a, that's an American tradition that goes back for hundreds of years. And I think, um, I think we were, you know, one result of this election is uh, our, a realization that we were asleep at the wheel a little bit. Hmm. And now you don't see that anymore. And, you know, even doing this podcast and as we tour America, which we've been doing, we have people come up to us all the time who say, you know, I've never been involved in politics before. I've never paid attention to politics yeah. before. Now we're gripping the wheel like it's blinding snowstorm. <laughs> right. And we got to get home. And now, and now they know all these things about American government and politics that just like nerds like us knew because we worked in the White House, you know, and they're like, <laughs> let's talk about the filibuster. And yeah, let's the talk filibuster. Right. We and know that because we was watched uh, West Wing. Well, West, right. Yeah. yeah, exactly. But people know all these intricacies of, of government because everyone's paying attention now. And I think you saw in the special elections in Virginia, in Alabama, where a Democrat won a Senate seat for the first time in 20, 30 years, um, you know, I think that there's going to be a resurgence, and that's a, that's a very good thing. 
So let's say that we are, uh, without knowing, asleep at the wheel here in Norway. Right. So what are we? What should we look for? Like, what's the signs? <laughs> if we are, if all of us are actually sleepwalkers right now, uh, how uh, how to wake us up? What should we look for? What's the problems that we should be able to see before it hits us really hard? I think the I think <sighs> anti-immigrant sentiment. Yeah. I think nativism. I think beware of demagogues and politicians who promise easy answers, who um, offer easy answers in terms of who to blame for your problems. Mm. Um, the problems that any nation faces are collective problems that require collective action. And I think that countries in Scandinavia and Nordic countries know that and, and act on that better than most. Um, but that's something to keep in mind because when things go wrong, there will be politicians who say, this has gone wrong because of this person or this group of people. And once you start down that road, that's when you start feeding the divisions and fostering the divisions that lead to, um, you know, sort of what we're going right. through in the we, United we, States. Unfortunately, there was a, a sustained, you know, several decade long assault, mostly by Republicans, on a lot of the institutions in the United States that are some of the most vital parts of a democracy. Started with the press, constant attacks on the press, and that didn't just come from politicians or Republicans, it came from Fox News and other media outlets, which just sort of whittled away at people's faith in what they were reading and what they were learning. And now we're in this bizarre world where you can have two media outlets reporting exactly different things and people just believe what they want. So that's a danger sign. Um, I think the thing that's most alarming that's still happening in the United States now that we all need to watch out for is attacks on our justice system and the rule of law. Um, you have FBI agents and DO, uh, Department of Justice employees being attacked uh, for simply doing their jobs uh, and having their credibi credibility and integrity questioned, and which is not to say they shouldn't have oversight, but those are alarming trends that we're still seeing. Um, so not everything is perfect, but I do think that um, you know what Donald, what Donald Trump did was not brilliant. It was not clever. It wasn't unique to him. It was a well-worn playbook of strong men, demagogue, uh, people with author authoritarian tendencies, um, that you can see coming. You just have to have the strength as a society to stop them. Yeah, and I just, I think one thing that came out of this election is a realization that neither party was really listening, um, that, that poll after poll showed that the American people weren't happy with the answers being offered by Democrats or Republicans. Um, uh, and then you see Brexit happening, a similar result, right? People saying they don't like being told what the right answer is. They don't like being told that Brexit, they, they don't like the situation as, as it is right now, but they're told actually, but don't vote for that. That's unacceptable, totally worse. And people have a funny way of being told, uh, fun, people have a funny way of reacting to what they're told is unacceptable uh, when they don't like what they're seeing right now. So I think uh, not, not ref uh, uh, Refusing to be honest about what people are saying about the politics they're given. That, that Democratic voters, Republican voters, independent voters were all saying that they didn't believe that the two parties in the United States were offering solutions for the problems in their lives. And I think one of the things that came out of this election is campaign, you know, activism, energy, yes, but also a soul searching uh, on the part of Democrats about whether or not we were offering ideas that were big enough, answers that were big enough to a changing world, to, to automation, to to a sense that globalization may reward the GDP, but doesn't create the kind of jobs people want to have. Um, and I think hopefully from that, we will see better kinds of answers. But I think always remembering that, 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 that people are suspicious of an elite telling them that there's only one way to do things. And people, as we do in our personal lives, we, we bristle at being told what the right answer is. That's true. I mean, if you have kids, you know that. It's yeah. the fact of life. They don't right. do as they're told <laughs> if yeah. you tell them something. Um, you see, it's not that far from uh, the things that we are discussing here. I mean, we're not, it's not that dif different. I mean, this optimization and jobs, and it's the same questions here, even if Norway is very different from America. What's but your big political challenge here? Or big political challenge? Uh, uh, okay, so I'm not the best one to answer the question in this room, <laughs> but since I'm here on stage, uh, you gonna depose okay, that prince? <laughs> so um, <laughs> if I say something wrong now, can someone please correct me? But I think our biggest problem is the funding of the welfare states in the years to come. Mm -hmm. uh, the government is over there. Is that? Uh, it's their fault. Is that Where's correct? the government? <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the, min the minister of work, she nods. 
Yeah. Well, at least that's a central. That's that's a difficult question for us. Yeah. How do we keep this society going? Like, how? Where do we find the money? And how do we keep people at uh, in in uh, jobs? Really. Um, okay, it's two minutes. I mean, Norway is interesting, but <clears throat> two minutes. Who's the next president? Is it Oprah? You just have to answer before we finished. Is she going? For you guys who didn't see that, Oprah Winfrey just, no, she didn't say it, but there's a story that she is going to try to become the next, or at least become president of the United States. So I just have to <laughs> figure out yeah. if that's true. She gave a, a very moving and inspiring speech at the Golden Globes Awards in the United States. And like everything else that happens in the United States, uh, the U.S. media went completely crazy. Collective, <laughs> collective meltdown. Collective meltdown. And for the last, it's been funny watching it over here and not being home for lunch and just sort of watching the news unfold. And over the last 24 hours, her candidacy began, took off, was crushed, and now I think we're on to the next no, person. No, it's comeback. <laughs> there was it's a comeback. Come come yeah. <laughs> yeah. We went through a cycle of like you know within the, 12 hours. The, I mean, it's so funny. The, the Oprah. <laughs> The Oprah boomlet on Twitter and in the media in the United States shows that we've we've learned nothing. I know, but that's okay. Um, the good news is the, the the nomination process will start uh, the day after the 2018 midterm elections, where okay. candidates will start going to Iowa, New Hampshire, and all the states that vote first in our primary process. So I don't have any idea who the next president of the United States or who the candidates will be, but there is a process set up where Oprah or any politician can run, uh, and they will get thoroughly vetted, hopefully more thoroughly this time than last time, uh, okay. to figure it out. I don't like you laughing. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Get some Think nativism out, love it. Sick of you people thinking you're better than us. <laughs> <laughs> Must be nice having all this oil. <laughs> it is, actually. <laughs> That's called luck. But it's also nice to have uh, you guys here. Um, <laughs> it is quite great nice segue. at least. It's a great <laughs> segue. Nice. Are we wrapping it up? Yeah. yeah see, there's this went fast. It did. <laughs> I want to stay. I was entertained. I hope you in the, the audience were. We actually, yeah, we are on, on the red. It's red now. See, it's in the red. Oh, so, red. yeah, that's a clear sign that we just seconds. have to leave. Get it all out, love it. You got yeah. 37 seconds. So I want to say one thing, <laughs> which is, listen, all right, Trump, we're with you. But, but it's not. Um, America didn't do this, all right? We're, we're pretty great still, all right? Especially our younger generation. A lot of this is a younger generation getting totally screwed by an older generation, kind of, kind of really throwing a grenade in our tent on their way out of, the, way out of town, all right? So we're trying, all right? We're gonna get to the bottom of all of this, all right? Stick with us. Okay, don't give up on us. Pardon our appearance. <laughs> well, don't pardon my appearance. <laughs> this is what <laughs> we're renovating. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> we're done here. <laughs> Thank you. That was great. Thank well, you very much. That was a lot of fun. Thank, Thank you, John. Great, too. I think we're back out um, that way. Cast the bongos. Yeah. yeah, we go. Thanks, guys. Yeah. <laughs>